I want to be able to hear God and not because I'm preoccupied. Challenge me! You gotta be willing to do what God tells you. Where does your strength come from? Where does your durability, your depth, where does your rebound, your spirit, your power, your ability, your resilience, where does your fortitude come from? Where does your force come from? I want you to recognize so many people are depending upon their money to bring them their strength, their, their looks to bring them strength, their education to bring them strength, their assets to bring them strength, who they know, where they work. So many people look to those things to draw their strength from. Every superhero gets his strength from a source. If you're a Marvel fan, then you are familiar with superheroes. And superheroes get their strength from somewhere. Thor gets his strength from a hammer. Captain America gets his strength from serum. The Green Lantern gets his strength from a ring. Superman gets his strength from a sun. Spider-Man gets his strength from a spider. And Batman gets his strength from a suit. But where did David's strength come as he stood before a giant as a teenager to kill him? And did conquer him. Where did that strength come from? Where did Samson's strength come from? I know he took a Nazarite vow that said he was not to be around liquor or, or alcohol and that his hair was not to be cut and to be around dead carcasses. But truly, where did his strength come from? He said he knew not when the Spirit of God had left. Where did Daniel's strength come from? that would allow him to believe that he would not be eaten in a lion's den? Where did the three, Hebrews, three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, draw their strength from? That they would not be burned in the fiery furnace, that the fourth man, Jesus, would jump into that fire to save them and protect them. Where did their strength come from? Where did Esther's strength come from? And says, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to defend and I'm going to protect my people. Where did Noah's strength come from? Preaching the gospel every single day for more than a hundred years, but not one soul gets saved. But he's faithful to continue to build and preach. Where did Nehemiah's strength come from? He is not a general contractor. He's nothing more than a cupbearer. But he's going to take on a challenge to rebuild walls that have been destroyed for numbers of years to bring a defense and protection to Jerusalem and to Israel. Where does your strength come from? Where does our strength come from? Here's a few scriptures that draw some, some thoughts to us about where our strength comes from. Napoleon Bonaparte, that many of us are familiar with, Napoleon had a map, and he laid out that map in front of all his lieutenants as he was conquering the known world. And he pointed to a red dot, a red spot on that map. And he said, I could have conquered the world if it was not for this red spot. And the red spot was the British Isles where Waterloo and the defeat in Belgium took place. He said, I could have conquered the whole world if it wasn't for this red spot. The devil today is talking with his minions about conquering the world. And he looks down at his map. He looks at a red spot on a hill called Calvary where Jesus' blood was shed. And he said, if it wasn't for that red spot, I could have conquered the world. I don't know about you. My strength does not come from my looks or my education or my cleverness or my ability or my talent or who I know. My strength, my power, and my ability comes from a, uh, from, comes from a cross. My strength comes from a cross. My strength comes from an empty tomb. My strength comes that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where my strength comes from. For the toughest day of my life, 
I'm going to draw strength from that. When I feel like I've been kicked like a can up down a street, I'm going to draw strength from that. When there's opposition like I've never faced before and obstacles that I've never faced before, my finances, in my marriage, in my family, here's where I'm telling you I'm drawing my strength from. It surely isn't from Jack Daniels or smoking Mary Jane. I don't know if you're old school today. I don't even know if you know what Puff the Magic Dragon is. But in my generation, we knew what that meant. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. My strength to endure what I need to endure and not to quote unquote cope or survive, but to overcome. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph. Nay, in all things, I am more than a conqueror. Caesar was a conqueror, but the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. Genghis Khan was a conqueror, but the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. Napoleon was a conqueror, but you're more than a conqueror, the Bible calls you. The Bible says in Ephesians, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 1 Corinthians says, watch and stand fast in faith. Be brave. Be strong. The Bible says in Joshua 1, 6, be strong and of good courage. Goes on in Kings and says, go the way of the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Chronicles says, but you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. All these scriptures speak about you and I being strong. And that's what you and I need today. We need to draw our strength from something that's far greater than you and I. I'm going to turn over to Judges, the 8th chapter. Judges, the 8th chapter. And I just want to share this thought with you today. When I talk talk about it's time to get pumped up, I'm not talking about pumping up the music, and I'm not talking about pumping up your muscles. But I am talking about how am I supposed to be spiritually strong? What does it look like for a believer to be strong in the Lord? What does that look like to power up in God? If you are experiencing a hopeless situation or simply desire prayer, please feel free to give us a call. We are here because we care. It's time to get real. Come as you are. And he said to Zuba and to Zalaman, and if I mess those up, then you pronounce them. What kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? These are the two kings that are left of the Midians. So they answered, as as you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. In other words, Gideon is having a conversation. He's saying, you killed people just like us. And, And they're saying, these kings, yes, they resembled you. They were your people. So they answered, as you are, so are they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers. Gideon said, you killed my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, this is Gideon's firstborn son, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. So Ziba, Ziba and Zulaman said, rise yourself, he's talking to Gideon, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and he killed them. <laughs> Zeba and Zumana, and took their crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. The thought here is this, for as a man is, so is his strength. Let that sink in for a moment. So he, these, these bad kings had something prophetic to say. 
As a man is, so is his strength. As you really are is where your strength is. We'll talk a little bit more about that. As a man is, not as a man drives, not as a man dresses, not as a man styles and profiles, not as a man plays basketball or is really good at a PlayStation or something. But he says something amazing. He said, for as a man is, so is his strength. Here's some lessons that I learned from this. Number one, strength can't be fooled. Strength can't be faked. Strength can't be uh, pretended. Eventually, it will be exposed. How many of you know you can't fake, you can't fake strength? Because you, you, you can fake it during peacetime. But you can't fake strength during adversity time. You can't fake it under pressure when there's a war or a fight going on, an argument going on. That's where your strength is going to be manifested. Whether you can control your anger, whether you can bite your tongue, whether you can restrain your hand from hitting something. You can't fool and you can't fake your strength. The pressure, the adversity will expose it. I also recognize that strength can't be delegated. You have to own it for yourself. You have to exercise it on your own. Be like you trying to go next door and borrow your neighbor's electricity. Your whole house is run on, on, on an outlet and an extension cord. How many of you know that won't work? You, you can't borrow it. You got you to gotta have your own power source. And I can't permanently borrow your source of power and expect me to have power. It reminds me in Acts of the seven sons of Sceva that try to seemingly borrow some power. And these demons talk through this man to these seven sons of Sceva and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who the heck are you because you ain't got no power, buddy. So you're trying to cast this out. The story is they're trying to cast out the spirit. But they don't have no power within them to overcome the spirit. So they're trying to borrow the name of Jesus. They're trying to borrow Paul. They're trying to borrow someone else. His relationship with God. And they don't have one on their own. I want you to recognize that strength cannot be delegated. Strength will be challenged, it will be threatened, it will be tested, it, it will be questioned. Proverbs 24, 10 says, if you, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Your, your strength is going to, it's going to be challenged. It's going to, it, it, you've got to put it on display. It's going to be challenged. It reminds me of the, the little girl that saw this real big muscle man. And, uh, you know, he was flexing in front of a mirror. And uh, he was showing his biceps. He was showing, his, you know, his, his chest. He was, you know, showing his legs a little bit. And the girl came up to the little girl, and she started pointing and says, what, what is that muscle for? And what is that muscle for? And what is that muscle for? And he, and he looked, and he said, girl, it's all for posing. And how many of you know there's just a lot of posing people? All they do is pose all the time. But they don't have nothing to use. They don't use it. What good is it to pose if I can't use it? The muscle, the strength is something that I need to use when my children are running wayward. When I've just lost my job. When I just came out of the doctor's office and heard that, uh, you know, I've been attacked physically with a diagnosis. That's when I need not to be posing. That's when I need the power, really. I recognize that strength, strength must be exhibited. It must be used, and it must be ready, as opposed to waiting, not ready, postponed, or denied. The Bible says that Gideon arose when he was challenged. When he was challenged, don't send a youth to do a man's job. He says, I'll show you. You calling me out right now, bud? Hack, hack, hack. What were you saying? As their heads roll across the floor. 
How many of you hear what I'm talking about? Strength. We're talking about strength or power. Strength must be exhibited. You can't have your strength waiting for something. Well, you know, I'm working on my strength right now. I'm working on it. Sometimes the enemy, sometimes challenges, sometimes adversities are not waiting. They're today and they're tomorrow and they're the next hour and they're next week. You better be ready. You better be ready. It's like the disciples who could not cast the spirit out of the lunatic boy. And they went to Jesus privately and they asked him, why could we not, why don't we have the power to cast out this spirit? And he said, this kind cometh up out by, by prayer and fasting. You need to have a readiness in your life that any moment adversity will come. You can't run away and go get your pump on. Go, go three days fasting, get into the word. and start. You better have this already ready and available to use at any given time. The Bible says that the veil and the curtain ripped in two. It signified that I don't want a religious relationship with people. I want a personal relationship with people. That no longer there'll be anything separating you and God. You don't have to go through a man anymore. You go through Jesus Christ. Hey, I had some questions, and I was hoping I could get some prayer. God always calls those things that be not as though they were. God always speaks possibility and potential, not, not limitations, disadvantage, and disability. God speaks, God speaks your future, not your past. God speaks who you are, not what you've done. God speaks faith, not fact. God speaks the end from the beginning. That's how God speaks right now. When he looks at your trouble, when he looks at your adversity, when he looks at your problem, he speaks the end from the beginning. He calls those things that be not as though they were. You're healed in the name of Jesus. When you're sick and your mind is tormented, you're delivered. He speaks life. He does not speak death. I said he speaks life. He does not speak death. And maybe somebody here today or somebody watching me has been hearing nothing but death in their life. Death to your marriage, death to your finances, death to your health, death to your mind, death to your dreams, death to your desires, death to your visions. But today I just want you to know God speaks life to you. In spite of what you've been through, you could have been under the bondage like Gideon of the Midianites, hiding, hiding, but God comes to him and says, you know what, you're a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor. Not too long ago, uh, actually, Cindy found out, I, I went, I went to, um, I went to buy something uh, somewhere, and I used my ATM card, and they told me that I, have it, that I had insufficient funds. Boy, that brought, brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> so it's been a little while since I've heard that. I'm familiar with that, but it's just been a little while since I've heard it. Because back in the day, I'd go up to the ATM at the bank and, and, and ask for a certain denomination, and they... You ain't getting that, buddy. Well, what's the lowest one you can give me kind of thing? So we found out that our identity was stolen and fraud was done. She pulled up the bank statements and she saw all, all these charges. And it was a lot of money that was stolen from our account. A lot of money was stolen. Someone stole my identity and they stole from my life. And that's the way the enemy is. But when we called and said, wait a minute, these are not our charges. This is not what we've done. They went ahead and returned back to our account all the money that was stolen. And I believe God's the same way. When you recognize that the enemy has been stealing my identity 
and he's making me live beneath the privileges of Calvary's cross and the benefits and the rights that have been given to me. And I've been treated like a victim and I've been treated like a slave. And I've been living under the authority of liberty, freedom, power, and victory that Christ has warranted on the cross of Calvary. I want you to recognize then your identity begins to come back to you. And it's no longer stolen. And things in your life begin to be rewarded and replenished in your life. As I close this thought out, strength comes from several places. And I finish now. Strength comes from waiting on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew. There you go. Strength comes from waiting on the Lord, hoping in God, expecting God, ministering to God. That's where your strength will come from. Nehemiah 8.10. What does the Bible say about strength? The joy of the Lord is my strength. So continuing to operate in joy, joy is who he is and what he's done and where he is. The joy of my salvation brings me strength. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's enough reason the devil is defeated to have joy. And that joy is a strength in my life. Joy comes from grace. 2 Timothy 2.1 tells me to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Strength comes from understanding God's grace in my life, God's unmerited favor in my life, God's forgiveness and acceptance in my life, God's empowerment in my life. Strength comes from the full armor of God. You're familiar with that. Be strong in the Lord and the power is mine. Put on the full armor of God, the salvation, the righteousness, the gospel, the word, faith, the sword of the spirit, and prayer. Strength comes from hanging around strong people. You want strength? To hang around some strong folks. You'll start praying like you, you know, like you never prayed before. You'll start quoting scriptures like you never quoted before. You'll learn how to trust God. You'll, know, you'll learn how to confess God's word. You'll know how to rebuke the enemy. You'll know how to uh, persevere through adversity. Hang around strong people. Timothy hung around a strong man named Paul. He said, let no one despise your youth. Why? Because he fell down. But he listened to Paul. I'm not going to let no one despise my youth. He would hear that. Stir up the gift that God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, Timothy, but a power, love, and a sound mind. This faith lived in your grandmother and in your mother Lois and Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you. Timothy draws strength from someone else. Hang around strong people. I want you to recognize there was an Indian, an old elderly Indian, who struck oil in, the, the back, in, in his backyard and farmland in Oklahoma. He lived a poverty-stricken life. The moment he became a wealthy, rich man overnight, he bought the biggest red, brand-new Cadillac he could find. It was fancy. He went and bought him some new threads, some new clothes. He bought four tires, and he put them on the back of his, of his Cadillac, placed them in the back of his Cadillac. And he drove his Cadillac all over. The, he'd go into farmland. He'd go off the streets. He'd just go rampant, you know. And every time you see people, he just wave out the, his hand, like, and he'd be driving, you know, and just waving his hand at every. Surprisingly, he never crashed, as crazy as he drove. Surprisingly, he never hit anyone, as crazy as he drove. You, you know why he never hit anybody? Because on the front end of his Cadillac were two horses that were attached to his bumper, and they pulled the Cadillac. <laughs> See, he had a key to the brand new Cadillac. It was his. But he had never put the key in the ignition and cranked up the horses. So instead of running with 300 horses, <laughs> he ran with two horses. The choice is yours. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might.
You know, Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said this, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Wow. You know, that's a scripture with absolutes. We live in a world where nobody wants to hear absolutes. We believe that we always have choices and we always have decisions and we always have options. But notice what Jesus said. He said, he that is not with me is against me. That means with Jesus, there's no neutrality. There's no universalism where you, everyone can believe whatever they want and all roads lead to Rome and it, you could have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and pull this out of this and add this to it and it'll all at the end equal the same. Not in that verse. Jesus said, he that is not with me. You gotta be more than a fan of Jesus. You gotta be a follower of Jesus Christ. You gotta do more than just believe in him. You gotta give your heart and surrender to him. It's more than just a life. It's a lifestyle. It's more than just going to church. It's a behavior. It's a relationship. It deals with obedience. He that is not with me, you know what? I am a true Christ follower. Automatically, the Bible says you're against him. Now, I know you're getting upset, and I know that's hard to deal with because you say, man, I'm not against Jesus. I may not be for him, but you know what? He's not my enemy. Yet Jesus said, if you're not following me, if you're not for what I believe, if you don't stand for who I am, if you don't believe that I am God, your Savior, then automatically makes you against me. And if you're not gathering people, gathering people by sharing the message, gathering people by living the message, gathering people by telling the message, then you're scattering. You're pulling away people from Jesus. Today, I want you to be an individual that gathers and doesn't scatter. I want you to be a person that says, I am for Jesus. I want you to give your life to him because no one loves you as much as he's loved you. And no one can heal you, deliver you, and change you from the inside, not the outside, but from the inside. You know those issues, those hurts, that rejection and pain? That's what Jesus does. He's the only one. Give your life to him today. Say, Jesus, come and live in my heart. Transform me, change me, and deliver me. And he's a Jesus that will love you into heaven in eternity. It's been real. Welcome to the family. You gotta be willing to do what God tells you.